Well, good morning. It is time for us to get started. We appreciate so much your presence here this morning. Yes, you do look a little bit more tired than you did yesterday and the day before, uh, but we are glad to be here. It's been a great week so far. We're looking forward to our last uh, full day of day lectures today. And we're going to begin uh, this morning with Brother John Gazetta presenting us a lesson from Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Uh, Brother Gazetta is no stranger, certainly, to Christians in the Tampa Bay area. He's been preaching the gospel here for quite some time. He lives in Brandon and has lived there since 2021, uh, where he currently serves as evangelist and one of the shepherds with the Brandon Church. Uh, he's been married to his high school sweetheart, Christine, uh, for almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years this summer. Uh, they have three children, Jonathan, Juliana, Jonathan, and Jessica, who all attended Florida College. Um, John, as I mentioned before, has been working in this area, actually preached in Lakeland from 96 to 99, in Lake Wales from 1999 to 2021, and since that time has been working with the Brandon congregation, and we're so thrilled to have him here with us this morning to bring us that lesson. Uh, before the lesson, as we've done the last couple of days, we're going to start with a song and with a prayer, and we have a couple of our students who are going to lead us in those activities uh, our song will be led by Julian Sink. He is a uh, junior in the Biblical Studies program. And our prayer will be led by Joshua Brown, who is a junior in uh, Biblical Studies and Communication. And so we'll start this morning, as we started the last couple of mornings, with, with a song, with a prayer, and then we'll turn the rest of the time over to Brother Gazetta. <laughs> Sing, Be Thou My Vision. sunshine and the beautiful weather. Thank you for the freedom that we have to hear your word proclaimed and to study it. And thank you for all these good people who are here who want to learn more about you, Father. Help us to make the most of our time. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to take what is, what is taught and to abide by it and to teach it to the world. In everything we do today, Father, 
whether it's talking to people or doing school or doing work or listening to lectures, help us to do all in your name so that you will be glorified. Bless the speakers and help them to teach the truth in a way that's clearly understood and helpful for the rest of the people. We love you so much, Lord, and we praise you and we honor you. Please forgive us when we fail you, Father, and thank you so much for your love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. What a blessing to see you today and to be together. I want to start <clears throat> with a story that is 100% true, although it's going to dramatically illustrate something that I want to talk about toward the end as we begin to draw some conclusions from today's discussion about Jesus as the perfect once-for-all sacrifice. About five years ago, a, a man that I know very, very well, a Christian in the area, uh, actually one who had done quite a bit of preaching, came surprisingly to my office and said, I need you to pray for me. And of course I said, sure, I'll pray for anybody, anytime, what is it that you need? And he told me a story that he had been parking his car uh, near his house, but kind of with the tires on the sidewalk. And okay, I'm listening to the story develop. And he said, well, a neighbor walked over earlier today and told me that that is illegal. And I didn't know that parking my cars with a tire on the sidewalk is illegal. And so I moved my car, but I was, realized that I was in sin. And so I've come to you as quickly as I could to get you to pray for me so that I could be back in the good graces of Jesus once again. That is an absolutely true story, and I stammered to know what to say. I certainly don't want to serve as anyone's priest and assured him that he could appeal directly to Jesus Christ, to God through Christ, for his forgiveness. But I was uncomfortable even with the idea that he was really out of the good graces of God at that instant. So with that story in mind, and perhaps with that mindset of moving in and out of salvation, in and out of salvation, almost daily or perhaps hourly, in contrast to what we learn in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, that's going to be the application that's driving our study this morning. Because I would like to do kind of what Ryan talked about in his lecture on Monday night, just fast forward to the application to make the important point that we who are in, we who are washed in the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, this perfect sacrifice, have a new nature, a sacrifice that was given for us that doesn't just propitiate the last sin, the most recent sin that we have committed, but one that really changes the sinner into a brand new creature. Am I just a sinner? I hear that terminology, in fact, I used to use that terminology quite a lot, and I'm not sure that I'm still comfortable with that idea of saying that I am just a sinner. And this kind of ugly slide before me was my quick effort to try to just briefly go through and find that word in the New Testament, specifically in the epistles, and kind of watch the way that word sinner was used. <clears throat> I'm aware of the fact that Paul talks about himself in the past tense, I think, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 as the foremost of sinners. I'm aware of his discussion in Romans 7. I think that also applies to his former nature. I'm aware of James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 that talks about turning a sinner from the error of his ways. But I really don't think that you'll find the word sinner applied, at least not with any regularity, to those who are Christians. We have a new designation, no longer sinner, one uh, characterized by sin, but rather the word saint, one that is characterized by holiness. We as Christians are children of God. We are saints. We are saved by grace. Of course, we are working to continue rooting out those last vestiges of the old man of sin. But we need to understand that because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, our very nature has changed. Since it is the first lecture on the last morning, I thought it would be a good spot to do a really quick review of what we've been talking about all this week. 
about how Jesus really is better than anything provided in the Old Testament economy. And as many of the speakers have said, better is the word that the Hebrew writer uses, but it doesn't fully express what the book expresses, which is that Jesus is the best. We might say that World War II, for example, was worse than World War I, and that's true, but that leaves open the possibility that there is another war, World War III, that we can imagine would be even worse than World War II. So worst has not been seen yet. Jesus is certainly better when we make that one-to-one -one comparison between what he provides and what the Old Testament provided, but he is also best. He is supreme. There is nothing better that can be imagined or conceived. God is supplying to us the very best he has through his son. And that is an amazing truth that I hope is not lost on us throughout this week, that God has given to us the very best he has to offer. And Jesus is best because he is the reality of a shadow. That word is used in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 at the beginning of our study today to describe the shadow of things that was found in the Old Testament. And I know that for a long time I, I was confused by that. And I thought often of a shadow in terms of like literary foreshadowing. You know, like the book or the movie where the camera notices the woman has left her purse on the table when she left, and you think, oh, that's going to be important later. And sure enough, it is. Later on in the book, she can't find her keys, and so she gets trapped. And we see how one thing foreshadows another. That's not the way that this word is used in Scripture. And nor is it like a version 1.0 versus a next new and improved updated version 2.0. It's not like driving a Corolla when you're a college student hoping to drive a Lexus later on in your life. Sorry, Juliana has a Corolla. Uh, instead, the idea of shadow in the scripture is an image cast by an object, representing the form of that object, but not the actual thing. It's contrasted in scripture to the thing itself, the body of the object. As you look at the two shadows on the screen behind me, you can make some conclusions about the character of those two individuals, even without knowing their names or who they are. I know that one of those I would rather hang out with, and another one I would rather ask investment advice of. Just by seeing the outlines of those two individuals, I can tell you which one I'd rather get into a fight with, just by seeing the shadow. But this makes us careful when we realize that Jesus is the reality to understand that it is not that sacrifices in the old law as a shadow were somehow incomplete or ineffective they actually were effective God tells us in his word that they did exactly what he described in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 20 the priest shall make atonement for them and they will be forgiven so those sacrifices, the shedding of animal blood, did provide forgiveness. And the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16 also provided atonement, just as God had said. But they did so provisionally. They did so because there was a greater reality that was coming. And of course, the eternal nature of Jesus Christ makes this true, that already in those sacrifices was embodied a perfect sacrifice that was coming later. I love this quotation from Edersheim. The sacrificial system conveyed to the believing Israelite the blessing that was to flow from the future reality to which they pointed until he should come who had all along given reality to it. So Jesus is the fullness. Jesus is the reality. And these Old Testament sacrifices were a shadow of that coming truth. For this reason, Hebrews 9 and verse 15, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Those sacrifices provided forgiveness because of Jesus, who was the reality. So now as we begin to focus in on the section of text that we have been assigned, 
I'm just providing here a quick overview of what we've said in the last few lectures about Jesus as a priest and in terms of his priesthood and as a high priest. And I just, I love alliteration, so I feel like once you figure out how to assign the same letter to the beginning of each topic, you you really understood it, right? So um, he was appointed by God personally in chapter 5. That shows his superiority. He holds his priesthood permanently, chapter 7 and verse 24. He ministers in God's very presence, chapter 8 and verse 1. Those have all been described for us already. We've seen how Jesus is the reality. Jesus is a superior priest. But also now to understand that his death on Calvary put away sin. And that his followers, that's those of us who are in, who are washed by the blood, that we have been fully perfected by his sacrifice. And this is true because of this amazing mystery that you'll find in different places in the scripture that Jesus is so special because he's able to do things that we wouldn't usually think could go together. For example, we read about how Jesus quizzed the Pharisees. How is it that Jesus could be both David's son and David's Lord? That was a puzzle. But the truth of that was his eternal nature, that he was the divine son of God. That's how that could work, that Jesus could be both David's son and David's Lord. We struggle to understand with our finite minds how Jesus can be both fully human and both fully divine. We know that 100% plus 100% equals something other than one. And that's confusing, but it's true because of the eternal nature of Jesus. And now, as we look at this screen, we remind ourselves that usually the priest and the sacrifice were two separate things. How is it that Jesus can be both the priest who presides over the sacrifice and the sacrifice itself? And again, that is answered by understanding the eternal nature of our Savior Jesus and understanding his resurrection from the dead. So what I would encourage you to do now is to go ahead and be turning in the scripture to the text before us. I'm actually going to start a little bit earlier to pick up the context. This is Hebrews chapter 10, but I want to start in Hebrews 9. And to read together this morning, starting in Hebrews 9 and verse 24. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So what we need to do to first understand the beauty and the truth of Jesus as our perfect sacrifice is discuss why sacrifice is important in the first place. And that is because a death must be paid when there is sin. You know, the doctrine of the cross is to many people an off-putting, sometimes even revolting or disgusting truth. And I'm not sure if you've had the same experience that I have, that Sometimes when we talk to a younger generation, there is confusion about why there needs to be so much blood and so much stabbing and so much death at the heart 
of our faith, of our religion. I thought that religion was supposed to make me feel good. It was supposed to be all rainbows and buttercups. And, and it does, as a side effect of understanding the truth of God, it does make us at peace and full of love and beauty. But it is, at its center, the cross. In fact, the cross can be equated in some ways to our faith. It is the word of the cross, which is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Sin requires a death because sin creates a situation where the wrath of God is poured out. So that the cross becomes not only a symbol of God's love, as Brother Moyer talked about here yesterday, but it is also a symbol of the disfigurement of sin, of the damage that sin does to a human being, of the death incurred as a penalty for having committed sin. So that the gospel message does not teach us that God just sort of shrugs his shoulders and says, that whole sin thing, that thing you did, we'll, we'll just pretend that never happened. That is not the gospel message at all. The gospel message, in fact, teaches that Jesus had to die. That if it weren't for this truth about sin, then Christ died needlessly. But in fact, he died offering his blood as a propitiation for our sins so that he would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The gospel is not that God just overlooks our sins pretending they didn't happen, but punished sin, pouring out his wrath upon his son Jesus, who by virtue of his sacrifice took our place. So at the heart of this truth of Jesus as a sacrifice is that he is a substitute, that we are the ones who belong there, that we are the ones who deserve that punishment and that wrath for our sins. But Jesus, because of his great love and the plan of God, took our place upon the cross and bore our punishment. Sin causes spiritual death. It is a separation between God and man, which was shown right there in the garden, where God promised to Adam and Eve that in the day that you eat of this, the day that you break my commandment, you will die. Well, we know that Adam and Eve lived physically for many centuries after that. So who is right? Satan, who said, oh, you will not die. Or God, who said, in the day that you eat of this, you will die. Well, in one very important sense, they did die. They were thrust out of God's presence, and a separation was created. So that a passage like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, or 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, can describe those who are physically living, nevertheless being spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, because the wages of sin is death. And if that situation goes unremedied throughout our lives until the moment that we die and we stand before God in judgment, then we will be thrust out of his presence eternally, because sin cannot abide in the presence of God. And that is the definition of the second death of hell, to be eternally separated from God. So it is the blood of Jesus' sacrifice that allows his life to substitute for our lives. That most important passage, Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, reminds us that the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. The idea of atonement being at its root a covering, that God is going to cover our sins by the offering of the blood of another creature. It is the blood by reason of the life that provides atonement. And of course we see this most of all in the imagery of the day of atonement where the high priest once a year entered into the presence of God offering sacrifices first for himself and then of course for the sins of the people as he brought the blood into the presence of God and made atonement for them, but for just one more year. In our reading that we have just done in Hebrews chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, you began to see already language that indicated that Jesus' sacrifice was different, that Jesus' sacrifice was special. 
all the way back in chapter 7, actually, is where this language starts, that this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Chapter 9 and verse 12, also just a little before the reading that we started, he did this once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Chapter 9 and verse 26, once at the consummation of the ages, this last dispensation, with the summing up of all things in Christ, once he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Chapter 10 and verse 12, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, wouldn't it be logical that if one sacrifice is good, a whole bunch of sacrifices would be even better? It's kind of like the logic of M&Ms in the bowl. I don't even know that I could say the word M&M singular. It's M&Ms plural, right? Because if one is good, then a whole handful or perhaps even many handfuls is great. So why wouldn't many sacrifices be better than one sacrifice? Because it's the quality, it's the type of sacrifice that Jesus offered that makes it sup supreme, better than all the rest. Number one, Jesus offered human blood. And we know that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin because that's not really an appropriate corollary for the soul of a human being. Human beings are made in the image of God. They're higher than the animal kingdom. So the offering of, of an animal can't really, truly stand in for the mind of a person. Only a human life could represent truly a human life. But of course, that only stands in for a one-to-one -one comparison. Maybe at the outset, at the extreme, one person could offer his life to satisfy the punishment for one other person. And really not even one other person, but really just one sin that that person commits. The amazing truth of Jesus' sacrifice is that he offered divine blood, blood that is much more potent than your blood or my blood, so that it is not just one sin committed by a person, the, the most recent sin, it is all the sins that that one person has ever committed. And not just that one person, but all of the people who are living in the world, potentially those who come to faith in Jesus, have their sins washed away as well. And not just all the people who are living in the world right now, but all of the people who have ever lived or whoever will live. The one sacrifice of Jesus is perfect, and it is enough. It is sufficient to cover, to atone for all of those sins because Jesus offered divine blood. But Jesus also did something special in his sacrifice in that he offered a fully surrendered will. Turn back to our passage in the book of Hebrews, and let's look at the next few verses, verses 5 through 9. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to the scroll of the, uh, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. After saying above, Sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Jesus offered something truly special in that he offered a fully surrendered will. And that is what that psalm describes for us, that Jesus didn't only come in order to offer his blood a substitution to take upon himself the wrath of God that was due to us as a result of our sins, but also to demonstrate what a fully surrendered will, what a truly obedient son actually looks like, something that God had been desiring all throughout the ages and yet finally was presented for us in our place in the person of Jesus the Christ. Well, I don't think that that eliminates our understanding of 
a theory of the atonement often called penal substitution. I still think it's an important component of what Jesus did, which is highlighted in this passage. He offered himself as a fully surrendered, obedient son. And we learn from that as well. The sacrifices of God truly are a broken spirit and a contrite heart, and that God will not refuse. So what does this once-for-all sacrifice truly mean for us? Let's finish out our reading this morning, verses 10 through 18, and then we'll make some final application. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 18. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart, and in their mind I will write them. He then says, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So the first thing to understand is that Jesus' sacrifice was so perfect, so fully satisfying, that when he was done making that sacrifice, you'll notice the language that he sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews says this over and over, chapter 1 and verse 3, chapter 8 and verse 1, chapter 12 and verse 2, and right here in chapter 10. In contrast to the priest's who are continually standing to do their work. That's a difference that you'll note in the text. The priests who continued in their work were standing. They were always busy. Jesus accomplished something that allowed him to take his seat for the work had been done. Now, I don't want to suggest that Jesus is bored, that he has spent the time from his resurrection until today and until judgment just sort of twiddling his thumbs waiting for something good to come along. No, he's reigning, as Ephesians 1 and verse 20 tells us. He's reigning at the right hand of God over all things unto the church. And he's also interceding and mediating on our behalf, serving as that high priest who appears in God's presence for us. The one mediator, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. So there is no need to perpetuate a separate human priesthood that would continue to stand between God and man or that would continue to offer sacrifices. And this isn't just a point of theology that, well, you can have it your way and I'll have it my way. To do so, to consider a continuing human priesthood, to consider the continual offering of sacrifices, somehow reduces the glory and the truth of what Jesus had come to do. It suggests that what he did once for all is somehow insufficient or incomplete. And that robs glory from our Savior. The sacrifices that we continue to offer as followers of Jesus are sacrifices of praise. And now, finally, we come to the final point, which is what I started with, to say that those who are covered by this sacrifice, those who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, truly have a changed nature. That we go from sinners to saints who are born again, who are renewed to a new creation. Again, this is emphasized over and over throughout this section. Chapter 10 and verse 10, by this will we have been sanctified, made holy, right? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Chapter 10 and verse 14, we have been perfected for all time, those who are sanctified. Chapter 10 and verse 17, God no longer remembers the sins that we committed. The guilt of them is taken away. Chapter 10 and verse 18, where there's forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. So I've become more careful recently about how I pray for forgiveness. 
I certainly do when I am cognizant of sins that I have committed, ask specifically for God to wash those sins away, to forgive me through the sacrifice of Jesus. But I'm not sure that I would continue to pray, God, please forgive me for all the sins I committed since the last time I approached you in prayer. Because that suggests that it really is a matter of my own human abilities to remember each and every sin that I have possibly committed. And I tell you that there are too many for me to keep track of. And it's very hard for my human mind to even know all of the times throughout the day and the week that I have fallen short of God's expectations for my life. And the notion that we are moving in and out of salvation on a daily basis because of these frequent lapses into sins that are oftentimes even unintentional is probably not the way to understand the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That this falls short of the reality that the author of Hebrews is describing. Not only is the sin washed away by the blood of Jesus, but the person washed in the blood is himself changed from a sinner to a sanctified one. Now, please understand what I'm not saying this morning. I'm not suggesting that as a Christian, I can just sin, sin, sin flippantly and not worry about it because, oh, Jesus has that taken care of. I have that special card that says I can sin without any sort of repercussions. No, that's not true. And a Christian who recants his faith in Jesus as Hebrews 6 and verses 4 through 6 describes, or who re-enters a life of sin, as James 5 and 19 through 20 describes, will certainly forfeit his salvation and will be eternally lost. And in fact, to no longer cling to the blood of Jesus Christ, I think is that sin described in Hebrews that is worse than having never known it in the first place. But I do not understand that the Bible teaches that a Christian drifts in and out, in and out, in and out of salvation. Again, this would make our salvation dependent upon our human abilities to recall every misguided act, every tire that was accidentally parked on a sidewalk, and to, I suppose, quickly pull over. I mean, my good friend was in jeopardy the whole time he was driving to my office, right? Because he was lost. If he had died, he would have gone to hell. I don't think that's the reality described in Hebrews about a Christian's situation. If so, that seems like a frighteningly insecure existence that has much more to do with what verse 3 says, a constant reminder of sin, than what verse 14 says, having been perfected for all time. How is it that this once-for-all sacrifice puts us as Christians into a state where there is no consciousness of sins? Now, I'm very conscious of my sins. I'm very mindful of my shortcomings. But the fact is that we find it hard to find things in life that are truly satisfying. When I go on vacation, I can have the best vacation I have ever had, and I'm on the flight on the way home already thinking about, ah, got to go back to real life, got to go back to work. So I start planning, what's the next vacation going to be? The vacation was great but it isn't permanently satisfying. And you know that you can have the greatest meal that you've ever enjoyed, a nice, juicy T-bone steak, and in just a few hours be hungry again and be thinking about the next meal. It's hard for us to imagine something so perfect that it satisfies forever. Imagine a meal that takes away the need to ever be hungry again. But that's as close as I can come from nature to the example of what Jesus' sacrifice does. There is not merely an exchange that is transacted. It is not a transactional kind of thing. It is a relationship that is formed. And now that we are saints, now that we are children of God through the perfect sacrifice of Christ, things are different. Now, you may say that this takes away the sense of fear that we need to have to keep us away from sin. And I don't think it takes away fear at all. Fear is a great motivator. And there are certainly times in our lives where we need to revisit fear and be reminded that if we don't follow through on our calling as Christians, we may be lost. 
and the fires and the prospect of hell certainly do motivate us from time to time to get serious about our faith. But I believe that thankful love is also a powerful motivator. And to meditate upon what Jesus did for me upon the cross and the reality of his perfect blood that takes away our sins so that we don't have to be living in fear of them, that is motivating as well. That ultimately we do not avoid sin and do good works to become good Christians, to get into the good graces of our Lord, chiefly in order to get saved. But we do our good works as a result of having been saved. We walk in a manner worthy of the calling, Ephesians 4 and verse 1 tells us. Fear is a good motivator, but thankful love is also a powerful motivator. And when I see Jesus' yearning face upon the cross, I am going to do my best to continue to mature and to eliminate sin from my life, to do a better job of conquering temptations. But on my own, I will never achieve daily moral perfection. And so we must rely upon the one perfect sacrifice to supply for us that which we can never supply for ourselves, which is the blood that covers our sins. I remain very conscious of my sins when I commit them, and I think all of us are going to resolve to do better. Pursuing, as Hebrews 12 and verse 4 says, the sanctification without which No one will see the Lord. That is a pursuit. That is a daily pursuit as a Christian. But I'm thankful to God that my sinfulness was atoned for once for all when I was washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a hopeful future stored up for those of us who are children of God, not guaranteed by our perfection, but by his perfect sacrifice. And so let us continue to hold fast to the confession. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, then the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's pray together, please. Our dear God, we are thankful for forgiveness in Jesus. And we are mindful of the sins that we continue to commit. We ask for your help in in identifying those in our lives and our conscience. Father, there are some sins that we commit that have been with us for far too long. We're thankful for your mercy and your grace and being patient with us thus far. Please help us to finally overcome those nagging sins and to root them out of our lives. Father, we love you. We want to be made into the image of your son, Jesus, to show his image and his life to the world around us and speak his words. And so we're so thankful for the forgiveness that we have through his blood, for the one perfect sacrifice that you supply for us. Help us to be thankful. Help us to be serious and diligent. Help us to be mindful of the heaven that awaits and to desire to dwell eternally with you. Thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die upon the cross for our sins, to take upon himself punishment and pain that was due rightly to us. You are such a great God who has done such great things for your children. Help us to be thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.